like I'd like to welcome everybody here. Appreciate your presence. Starting out our second session on the book of Ephesians, our lectureship this morning. We're certainly thankful for all present. Our brethren that are here from the spring congregation, we certainly appreciate you and your support of our lectureship. In fact, uh, if you look at the schedule, most of our speakers are from spring. <laughs> so we took advantage of uh, the good brethren at spring on our lectureship schedule this year. Um, and we look forward to hearing the lessons uh, this morning from the book of Ephesians, one of the greatest books revealing things about the Lord's church that I believe is in the New Testament, one of my favorite books to study. Uh, it's the book of Ephesians. And this morning we're going to start off with a lesson entitled, We Were All Dead in Sin, based on the text of chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Our speaker is going to be Jose Gomez. He is the uh, preacher for the Spanish-speaking congregation that meets there at the Spring Church Building and works closely with the church there at Spring. We certainly appreciate him. He's been a speaker on our lectureship in the past. We've heard him at Spring Lectures. He always does a great job, and we look forward to hearing him this morning. We'd like to have Jose, uh, Jose come up and speak to us this morning. Get your Bibles out, get your pencils out, and your notepad, and get ready to study the Bible. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, thankful for the opportunity of uh, being here uh, this morning, and I want to take the opportunity to thank Brother Bruce and the elders of this congregation for the invitation that was extended to me uh, to be one of the speakers in this lectureship. And I also want to thank the congregation, the members of this congregation, for uh, their hard work and making this lectureship possible as well. And I know that there are a few as well from, from spring as well uh, here this morning. So thank you for making the time and the arrangements to uh, be part of this, this lectureship. Uh, the general topic, as uh, Bruce was saying, is uh, the glorious Church of Christ. And uh, I have to say that this uh, epistle or this book is also one of my, my favorites. I mean, just because of the uh, information that we are given in the epistle to the Ephesians, uh, number one, I mean, we learn or we get a deeper appreciation for the gospel plan of salvation uh, when we realize or when we are told in this letter that it, it was a plan that God made uh, in eternity from before the foundation of the world. But then we also learn that uh, there is a contrast between the life that we were living before learning and obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ and afterwards. And it encourages us to remain faithful through trials and tribulations by putting on the full armor of God. Uh, this morning I have been assigned the topic, We Were All Dead in Sin, based in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, uh, 2, and 3. And I'm going to ask you to please go with me to that part of the scripture so that we can uh, begin this lesson by uh, reading this text, which is, again, Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1, 2, and 3. And I will ask you to please uh, follow with me on, on the reading. Um, I usually always mention this. I, I am reading the New King James Version. The reason why I do that is, because as you all know, English is my second language, so it makes it easier uh, to read this version. Uh, so again, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3. So it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So in speaking about this topic that was assigned to me, we were all dead in sin, uh, there's obviously many things that we could discuss from these three uh, verses of the Bible, uh, but I have decided to divide this lesson in three, in three parts. Uh, first, since the topic is we were all dead in uh, sin, we have to describe first the condition. What was the condition or, or the state of being dead in sin? 
And once we define that, then in the second uh, point, we're going to be discussing the consequences of remaining and uh, ending or leaving this world in that condition or in that state. And then finally, for our third point, uh, we're going to be talking about the solution, how we are able to or how God made it possible for us to get out of that state or come out of that condition. So with that in mind, we will begin discussing our first point. So when we talk about being dead in sins and uh, now uh, looking at the condition, what that entails, what that means, uh, there's a few things that we see in this part of the scripture. When we read that verse 1, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, we realize that that condition of being dead in sin, the first thing that it means is that there, that, that type of life or that condition means a separation from God, means a life that is fully separated from God. Now, when we read scriptures such as Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. So what we read from the scriptures is that being in that state, or being in that, um, uh, I guess, being dead in, uh, in, in our sins, what it means is that we are separated from God, but what makes that separation is the sin that is in our lives. And again, when we read Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2, the first things that, that he tells us is that it's not that God is not able to help us. It's not that God is not able to hear or to see the pain that we go through when we're suffering because of our sin. But the reason why God cannot come close to us or have a fellowship with us is because of that sin making that separation. Now, when we look at the scriptures and we look at, at one example in the Old Testament, uh, one of the scriptures that came to my mind is in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16 through 18. And in that scripture, God is speaking with Moses. And he's reminding Moses that he is about to go uh, the way of every human being, that he will join his fathers, meaning that he was going to die. And one of the things that God mentions to Moses there in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16 through 18, is he says that he knows that once the people of Israel go into the land of Canaan, he says, I know that they will play the harlot and they will go after the gods of the people where they are going to live. And so God already knew that that was going to happen. But one of the things that we read in verse 17, he says, And then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because of our God is not among, uh, among us? So one of the things that they realized, or God was saying, and when that happens, that they deviate from the truth, that they go after those false gods, I will hide my face from them. And God is saying, because of that sin, not only was he going to hide his face from them, but it says that he was going to cause many troubles and tribulations to come upon them. So when we look at that life, what is the state or what is the condition of a life when we were dead in sin? It is a condition where God is hiding his face from us, where God does not have any fellowship with us, and where there is that separation, that division that doesn't allow for us to have a fellowship with God. But that is not the only uh, description that we have in this part of the scripture about the condition of being dead in sin. When we look at verse 2, again going back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, In which you once walked according to the course of this world. So it tells us that not only is a life being dead in sin a life of separation from God, but it tells us that one of the characteristics is that it is a life in which we walk according to the course of this world. Now, what does that mean? Well, well, when we look at the uh, uh, epistle of the Ephesians and knowing that it was written to the people of Ephesus, we can at least look at a few aspects of the life or the course of the world uh, in, uh, in the people of Ephesus. Uh, one of the things that we know um, 
is that it was a life of superstitious beliefs uh, where they believed in magic, they believed in uh, all those things. And we know that because when we read the scriptures in Acts chapter 19 and verse 19, uh, we read that after some people try to, ex uh, I guess, do exorcism, uh, and they were overpowered by that, by, by that evil spirit, as the Apostle Paul continued to preach the gospel in Ephesus, we see that a great number was added to the church. But one of the things that caught my attention is the fact that it says in Acts chapter 19 and verse 19 that about 50 uh, a total uh, of books or a pile of books that was worth uh, a total of 50,000 pieces of silver was burnt because of people obeying the gospel. Now, what did those books contain? When we know that it was all uh, about the superstitious life that they had in, uh, in the city of Ephesus and but just the fact that all those books were burned, it just tells us how much time and money and effort they were putting into that lifestyle. Now, I read a, a commentary by uh, J.W. McGarvey, which I, I don't know if I, I might be wrong, but I, uh, based on what I read, I believe that it was written, that commentary on the book of Acts was written towards the end of the 1800s, like 1886, I believe, before the 1900s. And then one thing that I was doing last night, I just got curious. I was like, well, how much was a dollar worth in the 1900s? Or a dollar in the 1900s, how much would that be worth today? And with inflation and all that, it says that one dollar then, it, was, it would be worth about $36 today, a little bit over $36. And I say that because Brother McGarvey, when he put that, um, makes a commentary on that specific text, he says that then the value of those books was about $10,000. So if we calculate that 36 times today, that's about $360,000 worth of books that were, uh, that were burnt at that, at that time. So what that tells me again is how much time, how much effort, how much money people were willing to spend on those things. And that was the course of life or the, co the course of the world for the society of the people living in the city of Ephesus. Now, if you look at life today, it's not much different today. I mean, people still believe in all that astronomy, astrology, and uh, all those superstitious beliefs, and people invest in all that. And it's so much easier to do the same thing that everybody else is doing rather than finding the truth. But another aspect that we see of the life in Ephesus, living according to the course of this world, we see that uh, Ephesus was the home to one of the seven wonders of the world back then. That was the uh, temple that was uh, built for uh, Diana. Uh, Artemis, I believe, is, was the name that the Greeks gave it. But uh, knowing about that temple, so when it's described, it says that it was 450 or 425 feet long. 220 feet wide, and it had 127 pillars, 60 feet high, that would hold that structure together. But it's not only the time and money that was invested in that building. You see that one of the big problems that the Apostle Paul had in that city is that when he began to preach about God and preaching against idolatry, there was a businessman by the name of Demetrius who was really upset at the Apostle Paul because of all the money, the money he was losing once he was converting people from idolatry. But another thing about idolatry is when we study or read about the things that were being done inside that temple, we saw that it was not just uh, idolatry, but it was a lot of immorality. And there was a lot of uh, immoral things going on in that place. And uh, one of the things I, I got to say, I, I had the opportunity to visit that place last year. And out of those 127 columns that were holding that building together, that 425 feet long and 220 feet wide, there is only one column standing. Everything else is gone. And even that column is just a piece of it that is left in that, in that, in that city. But again, when we go back to the Apostle Paul talking to the Ephesians, that a life when we were all dead in sin is a life that, is, that means separation from God, but it's also alive that means living according to the course of the world. That meaning that a lot of the members of the church at one point were living just like the rest of the society. But then verse 2, going back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, 
not only tells us that it's a life in separation from God, it is a condition walking in the course of this world. But the second part of that verse two, it says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, what that means that it's also a life when we're dead in sin, it's also a life when we're controlled or we are under the influence of Satan. That's what the spirit of the of this world means. And then now the question is, how does Satan, how is he able to have uh, at the, such an influence on, on people or to be able to, to do that? Well, one of the things that we learn in the Bible or one of the examples that I see is in First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1. We see that Satan stood against the people of Israel. He was looking to find a way to make a plan and how to bring damnation into the people of Israel. And the way he does that, when we read in First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1, it says that when he stood against Israel, he moved or provoked King David to number the people of Israel. Meaning that he was able to go into the mind of David to helping to incite David, to instigate or to entice David to make a decision that was going against the will of God. And that is how Satan works. So when we are under the influence or we are living according to Satan means that we are doing exactly what he wants us to do. We become instruments of Satan. And that's what happened to King David. When Satan made a plan to hurt the people of Israel, he used David as the instrument to make that happen. You see that in the Bible over and over again, that every time that Satan wants to do something, he finds someone in whose mind he can have an influence to, help, to, to guide them to make a decision that goes against the will of God. And then the punishment comes from God. So again, when we look at life, um, or when, when we look at that condition of being dead in, in sin, Again, we said three things. Number one, it means a life that is in, in separation from God. It is a life in which we're living according to the course of this world. And it is also a life in which we are operating or living under the influence of, of Satan. But now the question uh, comes, how does one reach such a condition? Well, the book of Ephesians also gives us the answer to that question. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature uh, children of wrath, just as the others. It says that the, the, re, uh, or the way in which one reaches that state is by fulfilling or following the desires of the flesh and the desires of the mind. Now, in order for this, I mean, we know that in this world, there is a lot of different ways of temptation for human beings. For instance, we look at uh, the first epistle of John, chapter 2 and verse 16, and it talks about everything that is in the world. He talks about three different things there. He talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, saying that that is not from God, but that that is from the world. So when we look at those sources from temptation that can, again, have an influence in our decision making, uh, the way that we fall into that state of being dead in sin is by giving way or allowing our fleshly desires and the desires of our mind to take over our lives or over every decision that we make in our lives. And that's how we, again, we reach that state. Uh, it is the pleasures of life actually that keep us even when we hear the word of God or when we know the word of God, it is a lot of the times the, ple the pleasures of life that keep us from obeying and putting into practice what we learn about the word of God. Now, we know that because our Lord Jesus Christ, in explaining the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, he talks about the part of the seed that fell among the, uh, the thorns. And he says, now the one that fell in the thorns are those who, when they heard go out and are choked with the cares, riches, and pleasures of, li pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. So we learned that the reason why many people are not able to do the will of God and to obey God's word is because of the pleasures that this life offers. So again, going back to our first point, 
we begin by describing that condition of being dead in sin. And we have said that being in that condition of sin or being dead in sin is a condition of separation from God, a condition of living according to the course of this world, a condition that act of acting under the influence of Satan, and a condition that we reach when we let our fleshly desires and our desires of our mind to take over in the decisions that we make. But now we move on to our second point. And on the second point, we ask the question, what are the consequences of remaining and departing from this world in that condition of being dead in sin? Well, when we look at the scriptures, we can see that there are, there, there are at least some immediate consequences and that there are some eternal consequences. As far as the immediate consequences that we see is that a person that is dead in sin, that is in that condition, we read in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3 that we are able to have fellowship with the church, with one another, but that that fellowship is really with God and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So one of the blessings that we have as Christians is that we have not only fellowship with God, but we have fellowship with one another. So one of the immediate consequences of someone who is dead in sin is that he misses out and one, having fellowship with God and every blessing that comes with it. And number two, they miss out on having fellowship with the church and everything that comes with it. For instance, when they miss out, then when they miss out in the fellowship with God, one of the blessings that we have as Christians is that when we go through trials, when we go through very difficult times in our lives, we can have the confidence that we can approach God in prayer. And we know that if we're striving to live a life righteous before God, a life in obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that God will listen to our prayers, and we know that in the most difficult times of our lives, we have the comfort that comes from God, and we have the peace that comes from God that everything will work out for our benefit in the end. But then also, not only do we have that certainty, and not only do we have uh, that confidence that God is with us in our difficult times, but then also we have the church. We have our Christian family with us. And we know through the scriptures that when one member of the church is hurting, the rest of the members are hurting with that member. And also we know that when one member of the church, the church rejoices, the rest of the members are rejoicing with that member. So again, when we look at the immediate consequences of someone who is dead in sin, is that he will have to suffer on his own when he is going through very difficult times. There is no comfort from God. But then number two, he doesn't have or he is missing out on having the support from the church, whether that is through prayers, whether that is through visitation, whether that is through uh, any physical help or any other type of help. They don't have that. And those are some of the immediate consequences that they, they miss out, again, when they are in that state. Now, not being able to fellowship uh, with the church, one of the things that we experience as Christians is the joy of being together. For instance, this morning, we are here, we're listening to God's word, we're worshiping God together, we're singing together, uh, we're uh, praying together, and not only are we having that fellowship, but it's a time when it is, a, in a sense, it is escaping from everything out in the world. I'll tell you, one of the things that I do enjoy is every week we have to get up, we have a routine, we go to work, we have worries about things going on at our house, we have worries about things going on at work. But one thing is for certain, when we come to the service together with the church and together we're singing and together we're listening to God's word, that is a small break that we get from everything outside in the world. It is a peace that we can enjoy as Christians. A person that lives in that state or is, is in that condition of being dead in sin, they don't know that joy. They don't know that peace of what it is to come to worship God. And for a moment, we forget about everything and we are reminded of the hope that we have after this life. But another thing that they miss out is not only in worshiping God together, the peace that comes with it and the blessings that come with it. Another consequence is that they miss out in having fellowship with the church. And that's one of the things that we enjoy the most. The most. We look at the church in the first century, how the members, they uh, not only worship together, but they were visiting one another in the homes. They were having fellowship and partaking of the meals together. 
having conversations, encouraging one another. And that's another consequence or immediate consequence of people who remain in that state of being dead uh, in sin, that they are not able to enjoy that fellowship. They're not able to enjoy that time together with members of the church. But then comes pain and suffering. Because another consequence of them, as I mentioned earlier, is that all of us are going to suffer in this world. And one of the thing about, things about people that are dead in sin is that as they suffer, not only are they suffering alone, like we already mentioned, but then they have no hope. When a family, a close relative, or someone they love, they love dies, the hurt that they experience, the pain that they experience, is different than the pain that we experience. Of course, even when we lose a loved one, we know that it's hurtful, we know that it's pain, but the difference is we have hope. And we know that we will see them, and we'll see them again, but people in the world that live in that condition, they don't have that hope. So then only do they go through pain, but all that pain, uh, having no purpose, having no reason for it, it is just pain, right, that is accumulated on that person's heart and that mind. And again, they don't have the comfort from God, from the church, or a hope of eternal life after this one. But then we begin to look at not just the immediate consequences. There are also eternal consequences if someone remains in that condition departs from this world, and there will be consequences in eternity. And the Bible tells us, especially God, one of the things that came to my mind when I thought about that eternal consequence, that God does not want sinners to die in that condition. God does not want people that are dead in their sins to depart from this world in that condition. Uh, We read that in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 23, and then verse 30 through 32. I want you to go with me to that scripture because that really expresses the thought on how God feels when someone departs from this world in that condition of being dead in sin. Again, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, it reads, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. This is exactly describing the condition that we are talking about this morning. The condition of someone who is dead in sin. And what God is saying, God is hurting. And he says, do I want them to die in that condition? Is it not my desire that they (laughs) repent, that they get right with me, and that they live a true life? And then again, we keep reading there specifically in verse 31. It's, it's asking them to cast away their transgressions. And it says, for why should you die, O house of Israel? And then in verse uh, 32, I believe it was, uh, there was one specific thing that I read. Oh, verse 30, I'm sorry. Repent, repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. It is sin that ruins our life. It is sin that ruins the life of a person in that state, not only here on this earth, but even after we depart from this world. And when I look at the the pain that God is expressing and not wanting anyone to die in that condition, it makes me think of the example of King David. We read the book of uh, 2 Samuel, specifically chapter 12 and chapter 18. And in both of those chapters, King David lost a son each time. But do you notice that the way in which he reacted to the death of both of his sons was totally different? For instance, we read in chapter 18, after Absalom died, specifically verse 33. 2 Samuel 18, verse 33 reads, Then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he wept, he said thus, O my son Absalom, 
My son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died in your place, O oh, Absalom, my son. Do you realize the pain? Are we able to get an idea of how painful it was for David to know that his son had died? But the question is, why was it so painful that Absalom was dead? Well, it was painful because of the condition in which Absalom died. David knew what was going to happen to Absalom. He knew the condition in which he had died. And that's why earlier, when we read in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22 and verse 23, you remember the servants did not want to tell David that his baby son had already died. David knew it. He figures out that his son is dead. He asks the question. They confirm and when he finds out, it says that he went, changed his uh, clothes, and he ate. And then they questioned David. They said, hey, why, when your son was sick, you were whipping, you were crying, and you were not eating. But now that you know that your son is dead, now you're not crying anymore, and now you are eating. It is the answer of David. He says, well, I was praying and I was weeping because I know the mercy of God that maybe he would have mercy on me and let him live. But now that he's dead, I know that he cannot come to me. But he, David says, but I know that I can go to him. That is a whole different reaction. Why? What makes the difference is that Absalom was dead in sin. He was alive, but while living life on this, on this earth, he was dead in sin because of everything that he had done not only against his father, but against God. And being in that condition, that's why David was hurting so much when he finds out about Absalom dying. But that's why he found comfort when his baby son had died, because he knew the places where they were going to were completely different places. It was the complete different conditions for both of them. So again, when we read the scriptures, we see uh, why it is that God, when we read in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, people talking about the second coming of Christ and how some say that God is slack in that coming. Well, so, well, Peter tells us that is not the case. But the case is the same as we, as we read in Ezekiel chapter 18, where God does not want sinners to, to die on that state. But he is giving them time so that they can repent, so that they can be get right with God and get out of that state. Because there are not only uh, immediate consequences, but more than anything, there are consequences for eternity. And finally, we get to our last point. So we've talked about the condition. We described the condition. Number two, we talked about the consequences. And number three, the solution. We read in Ephesians, again, chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And you he made alive. It is God who brought the solution. It is God who brought the answer to the problem of being dead in sin. Now, we know how God did that. We know the plan of redemption. He sent our Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross. We know that by learning and by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, our sins are cleansed. Not only our sins are cleansed, but our conscience for God or before God is, is clean as well. We know that that obedience to the gospel and baptism means the birth of a new life. The old man dies and a new person, a new creature is made after baptism so that we get a new start. Now, another thing that we see um, again on this point is that once we get into that state that God makes possible through the obedience of the gospel, it changes our life completely. Remember, we were all dead in sin. And what that means, we were separated from God. We were living our life according to the course of this world. We were living our life according to Satan under his influence. We were following our desires, our fleshly desires, and the desires of our mind. We had immediate consequences and we had uh, eternal consequences, but now everything changes. And all that change begins in the mind. We read in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, it says there is also an anti-type which now saves us. Baptism. Notice how it says in parentheses, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
So in baptism, not only are we forgiven of our sins, but our mind changes. Our mindset is converted rather than, again, as we saw in the first point, living our life according to the world and according to Satan. Now our mind wants to please God. And that's what it's doing. Now, we read also in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 that when it begins in the mind, now it begins to show itself in our actions. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So what we see again, it begins in the mind. Now we want to have a good conscience toward God. And in doing so, we begin that renewal of the mind. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And by renewing our mind, we begin to change how we act, how we live. And our actions reflect a life that now is no longer about pleasing the desires of our flesh and the desires of our mind. But rather pleasing the desires of God as we find them in the scriptures. And again, another thing that we see is that now that life that had no meaning that had no purpose, now has meaning and has purpose. And we set our minds not, of, not on the things of this earth, but on the things that are in heaven, high above, which is what we read in Col Col Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 3. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. One of the examples uh, opposite of what we read here is the example of the foolish rich man that we, lead, uh, that we read about in uh, Luke, I believe it's chapter 12. And what we read about that man is that he worked so hard all his life. Crops were raised. He looks at everything that he's built. He says, I have too many things. They do not fit in my barn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tear everything down. I'm going to build them bigger. I'm going to store everything. Then I will tell my soul, rejoice, be at peace where you have for many years to come. But it says that that very night, it is told to that man, your soul will be taken from you today. And everything that you have worked for, what is going to happen with that? Now, with that, it doesn't mean there is, there's anything wrong with us working, trying to succeed in this world. But the problem is when that becomes our number one priority. And what we learn as Christians in this new state, which where God changes our perspective, he changes our mind, he changes our actions, he also changes our hope. When we have no hope, now we have a hope, and that's why we focus on the things that are high where Christ is, where God is, and that's, that is where all of our efforts and all our, uh, our work is, is focused. And again, uh, we finish with this. A life um, or the solution that God offers is a life not only with hope, but with hope and all the promises that God gives us. One of them is what we read about in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The whole chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the resurrection and the new bodies. And one of the hopes that we have as Christians that we enjoy thanks to that solution that God brought, brought about is that we have the hope that even if we die, we will be resurrected. But we will not be resurrected with the bodies we now have. We will be resurrected with celestial, with better bodies that are uh, ready to go to heaven and be with God there forever. But not only is that the only hope, as we read about different hopes in the Bible, one of the things or the main point that I want to stress here is that God changes everything through obedience to the gospel. And uh, I hope that this lesson is able to help us in, in some way to value the life that we had before coming to obey in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A life that had no meaning, a, had the life, a life that had no real meaningful purpose. It's a life that now God has converted to a life of purpose, to a life of meaning, to a life of, hope, to a life of hope. And the way that God did that was through the obedience of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate that fine lesson. Great way to get us started off on our lectureship. The transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everyone who is the age of accountability ends up in sin and in the condition that Jose described 
and we as Christians need to reach out to them with the gospel because they need it so badly. We're going to stand adjourned to the top of the hour, about 15 minutes. Stretch your legs, go to the bathroom if you need to go. Get a cup of coffee, we have some. So, dismissed.